everybody, welcome back to the Lynx Cast. I'm your host, Matt. And I'm Tyler. So this is the Linux cast. We talk about Linux things, and that's usually what we do. So, hi. Usually. Yes, well, usually. The, the, the thing about usually is that it, if you usually do something, there's also times where you usually do something else, too, and that's usually <laughs> uh, the case as well. Uh, we have a tendency to do tangents. It's just, it, it's it's part of our charm. You know, mm-hmm. it, yeah, if yeah. we didn't do tangents and rat holes and stuff... Well, I mean, come on, man. It, 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 okay, if we didn't actually have some banter back and forth, this would be like news, like CNN or Fox. It'd be dry as hell uh, and boring. It would be boring. Yeah. All on. right, so if you're watching the, the, the video version of the podcast and you see me switch my headphones around like this or take them off randomly, it's not because I'm ignoring Tyler's voice. It's because these headphones a murder on your ears when you wear glasses. Like, they're so... The, the cups are, like, wearing plastic. They're horrible. I need new headphones. Like, with actual proper cups and not, like... You know, you know like, those, like, $10 headphones you'd get for, like, a kid for, like, a road trip or something? And, mm-hmm. uh, because they really... They, they, they look like Beats, but they actually came from, like, the dollar store. <laughs> That's what these things feel like. <laughs> horrible. Well, I um, mean, that was a that was a good cover cover excuse, but we all know what it really is. You just don't want to hear me. Yeah, I, we get. It. We get it. <laughs> I'm sorry, Tyler. What were you saying? <laughs> 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 <All right>. Huh? <laughs> what? So, uh, Tyler, what have you been doing this week on Linux? Wait a minute. Are you using Linux? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, there is a my mom's laptop's running Linux. Uh, oh, does that not count? Oh, you, you know okay. it's bad when your mother uses Linux and you don't. <laughs> I was actually... <laughs> my uncle came over and he, he saw my computer and everything. He goes, is that Windows 11? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, you're... He, I was just in there and your mom's computer. She's running Ubuntu. And I'm like, yeah. She's like, your mother is running Linux and you're not? And I'm like, Yes. <laughs> For shame, dude. For shame. That's, that's horrible. Uh. So, um, I haven't been doing... Well, actually, I, I take that back. This, le- this week in Linux, I did update my mom's laptop. There we go. I've done, uh, that's my week in Linux. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, what, other, what other things have you been doing, then, if you can't talk to us about uh. the things we're actually here for? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, other than that, I have been developing the uh, open source game. Um, I, uh, for anybody who's like kept up with the channel, um, like or my channel, I have been. Uh, I was working on a um, a runner game, an endless runner uh, in Unreal, um, which. Thankfully, this is one of the times in my life where I can say this. I have that project backed up in multiple places, and it is perfectly fine. But um, me and a couple of other people from the Discord, uh, Art Center, and Phoenix Python, uh, we've started working on a game that like I'm really excited about. I really like survival games. I love them. And there's not really a good open source survival game. Um that's you know first person kind of like in the vein of like daisy dead side those kind of games um so we are working on that right now and i've gotten a lot of work done and there's a devlog that'll be coming out uh either later tonight i might schedule it to come out tomorrow morning but uh, it's been a while since i've posted so I'm probably gonna do that tonight but uh yeah i'm excited to show that off Sounds like fun. I've seen some of the stuff like rant, like you know how Discord will every once in a while show you what the other person's sharing in their screen, even if you're not mm-hmm. in the things. I, I've seen you guys doing some stuff. Um, all right, so me, uh, I've been using Linux by the way. Uh, mm-hmm. Just want to mm-hmm. point that out. Um, I've I've been messing around with the AnyBar patch for DWM. I haven't got it to the point where I'm actually using uh all the you know getting it you know i got it installed but i haven't actually gone through and done anything with it yet but uh, that's the next thing i just started it yesterday um and then i got distracted by other things but mostly what i've been just dis- getting distracted by is actually setting up a web server for a website i know right it's it's, it's but, but hold on here's the thing last week last week <laughs> we were told the website existed uh-huh <laughs> 
It's, and we were going to get it. Still does exist. And there is a uh-huh. there is now an a Linode account. There is now a Linode server. It has Debian installed on it. And, and if you don't believe me, I have a picture in my Discord of me SSH into that server. So it does exist. Um, all that's left is me learning actually how to set up a static website on a Linode server, which I've never done before. So... Uh, that's what I'm working on. It's just taking me some time. I've never promised that this was going to be a fast process. It's just <laughs> it's a process. Uh, by the and time that's your, that's your saving grace right there <laughs> that you never put a deadline on it. The number one rule they tell you because uh, you did freelance writing for a long time. The number one rule you you learn is never be as when they don't set the deadline, the client doesn't set the deadline. If you they give you the option telling you, hey, how long is this going to take? Never set a firm deadline. Say, yeah, I'll have this to you in the next 24 to 48 hours. And that Ooh. gives you some time to procrastinate. And this, this, these are procrastination rules. You know. I mean, technically speaking, last week you didn't explicitly state that the website would be up this week. You didn't say that. I made, I've made. i made progress, and that's literally all you should expect from me at this point. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and it's just the truest thing. It's just... It's just you know, if you expected more, that's your problem. Your expectations are the ones that caused you those mm-hmm. issues, not me. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I feel like me and TFL, I don't know if we've had this conversation before, but, you know, kind of one of the most unhealthy things that you can do is set really, or in general, setting expectations for stuff is kind of setting yourself up for failure. Because, well, we talked I mean, about this last week about me and my sports teams. I always expect them to lose. And well, then. You know, I can well, even surprised. if you don't like even expecting them to lose, because then when they win, like you're like, oh, like if you just don't set any expectation at all, you just go into everything blind. You'll typically end up having a better time, you know, just typically. Yeah. All right. So let's go ahead and move into the contact information. Uh, I'll see if I can do this in one go. So if you want to follow us on Twitter, you can do so at the Linux cast. You can subscribe to all of our stuff at the Linux Eventually keyword there eventually this is where i get this is the this is how you do it tyler Mm -hmm. (laughs) eventually there will be a a website at the linuxcast.org it's not there yet it's it's literally inching closer the close it's it's like if you remember math class if you remember limits in math class it always is getting closer to the thing but it never actually gets there that's the way this is going to happen to happen as long as we don't start talking about uh, uh, like geometry and proofs and stuff i'm good i hated those things anyway so you can support me on patreon at patreon.com slash linuxcast you can contact us via email at email at the linuxcast.org you can support tyler on odyssey and on youtube at youtube.com slash zany og you hit we both also have discord servers you can find those links in the video description you can uh join the telegram group which i swear to god does exist i don't know why it's there um i i don't know anything goes on about in there so if you want to get not in there i still don't believe it actually exists i think this is a rumor (laughs) i have links for it it's there i don't know why i set it up it was just a random thing like hey i got five extra seconds i'm gonna set this up anyways you can also uh, i I do have a quick question before you finish it out on the website will you have analytics on like being able to see like how much traffic it gets or anything like that no that's way too much okay okay um i mean maybe someday but right now, no, because it's literally just okay. HTML and CSS. There's no JavaScript. There's none of that stuff. Uh, I'm not even, as far as I'm aware, I'm not even pulling in anything other than a couple Google fonts. And you can do that oh, via God. like a, a URL via CSS. No. So, um, yeah. So there's it's it's not that complicated. It's yeah. Literally, the only reason I'm this far along is because I stole Hex DSL's website and took Ooh. all of his stuff off there and made it my own. That's the reason why. <laughs> and this is what you get for doing things Creative Commons, because anybody can steal your work. Exactly. Okay? Well, yeah, it's perfect. I mean, here's the point. Just like, come on in and take it. <laughs> hey, you want to know what? It's got me farther along than... I mean, I've been, pro- I've been promising a website since the podcast began in 2017. <laughs> Oh, I know. <laughs> so, uh, it's only it, it's only five years later. We'll get there eventually. People, just calm It'll down, cool, cool down. Don't don't move so fast through life. You know, <laughs> gotta take things a little slower. <laughs> you can also subscribe to the channel on YouTube at youtubecom slash cash where you'll find videos of all sorts and all brands and all stuff and all sorts of shenanigans. 
uh, today you'll find a crack video, which, I, which I'm calling, uh, it's a, it's a video that is utterly pointless about Vim, uh, and it was very fun to edit and make, but I don't think most people, I mean, people are just gonna laugh at it. There's also a Patreon exclusive up about me switching to Windows, so. Oh, oh okay. If you, if you wanna, uh, if you wanna see that, uh, tr troll of the week, you'll have to be a Patreon to see it, <sighs> so. <laughs> Anyways, that is it for the contact information. That was pretty good. Uh, so every week, Tyler and I scour the interwebs for that is true. Uh, news. And oftentimes we actually find news. And uh, when we do find news, we put links in the show notes and then we talk about them here on the podcast. So, Tyler, what is your news of the week? Well, thank you for asking, Matt, because, you know, a lot of people don't ask what my news is, and it gets really upsetting sometimes because this week I actually have, like, good news. Like, it's actually informative. So there's a, like, big, uh, like, backdoor piece of malware going around called Sys Joker, and um, it's, it's available for all platforms. It's fantastic. Like... You know, we're all we're all dying for uh, multi-platform, um, platform agnostic video games. You know, like there's nothing better than being able to play like games like Fortnite, but you know, just with everyone on whether they're on iOS, whatever, they can all play together. Now we can all get malware together. This is the world that we should be living in. Okay. All of our malware should be written for Windows, Mac, and Linux. So I, I hope we're all happy. We are finally part of the real crowd. We're accepted. We're mainstream. So Sys Joker is this malware that like um, it on Windows. Uh, there's not as like I didn't dive through here uh, too much because I'm, I'm going to assume the way it functions is it's similar on different systems. Like uh, on Linux, it's a little bit different. Um, it like on on Linux, it uh, goes through and it tries to. It, the files and directories are created under a, a folder called dot a library with a capital L, um, and uh, then persistence is established by creating a cron job. Uh, and it on, like on Windows, it it does this nasty thing. I don't know if it does a similar thing on on uh, Linux, but it goes through and it drops like a DLL. Uh, to execute and then uh, once it does the malware sleeps for up to two minutes uh, before creating a new directory and copies itself as an Intel graphics common user interface service uh, so yeah. it tries to it tries to act like it's an Intel graphics service F society in the in the in the chat said I should stop using plan 9 I want to have malware too <laughs> exactly, exactly. Just join the crowd, you'd be feeling left out uh, so the I have a question for the Linux version. Do you know if if you just ran crontab and view, viewed your crontab file, would this show up listed in the crob crontab? You know, it it should it should sh it should show up as any other regular cron job, um, and you'd be able to tell it uh, by uh, it's the cron jobs at reboot and then in quotes uh, slash dot library slash system services slash update system. So all those people who are uh, very against system D are probably rejoicing now because their cron jobs work differently <laughs> than on, you know, well, on system D does. Well, and see, that's the funny part about like it, it, Linux has one of these weird spaces where even like people complain about writing software games and stuff for Linux because, well, Linux can be different like one linux distribution can be very different than another one so even when you're trying to write malware for linux like which specific linux distros does it even affect yeah like, so even though this malware is technically for linux it might not even function on your linux distro now granted that most of linux is using system d so yeah, have fun, but yeah. Again. Well, I'm using SystemD right now, and I've been messing around with SystemD on MX Links, which uses SysVNet by default. But I think that's what it's called. But anyways, the mm -hmm. so uh, it makes me kind of use want to use MX Links 
little bit more, but or switch over to like something like Void, like completely different, where it's just run it. You know, now, I, I mean, where's Joshua Lee when you need him? Of course, you should just use Gen two because Gen two oh, yeah. uses oh, oh, run run it or Open RC or whatever the hell it is. Yeah, uh, it uses Open RC. Well, actually, I think with Gen two, can't uh, no, we're not going to get into it. Gen, Gen two, you discuss. can you can use System D, yes, but you're not supposed to. Like it even well, says, yeah. it says well. In the, uh, well what I was going to say is I think with Gentoo you can use any init system. I'm sh- sure you can. I mean, technically with Arch you can use any init system too, right? It's just Really? Yeah, there's instructions for using other init systems. Um, they're not very good instructions, but they exist. Yeah. I've, uh, I couldn't imagine using Arch with something. Like, I, I with mean, so many binary if packages. Use, but, if you use Artix, you're using Arch with a different init system. So. Yeah. But they, they, there's a lot of packages that they re like repackage well, for yeah, because the vast majority of packages are made for System D, right? The, the, I mean, that, that's what I was saying. Like, if you did install something else with Arch, like almost every package you download would be built for System D. So, I mean, like, it'd be like using any other distribution with a different init system. Like, it's it's the same problem I've been having with MX Linux using a different init system. It's just yeah, true. There are certain things that just won't run. So, like for example, there's a there's a Rofi plugin called Rofi Power Menu, and it allows you to shut down, reboot, and stuff like that. Won't work on MX Linux because it was written for System D. It uses System D, the 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 utils to shut down and reboot and stuff that rely on System D. Uh, so well, just rewrite the program, man. Come on. Yeah, no, no, Takes no it, time. Come on, let's it, rewrite it. It's weird because like they've put an alias and. Alias is an MX Linux is at least uh, it may not be an alias, but whatever it functions the same way. It allows you to use the same like syntax to shut down from the terminal and stuff. So you'd think that it would work, but it's not actually apparently not doing this the same way as I was expecting it to. Uh, but anyway, so my uh, news this week is that the um, the Canonical Boys are at it again. They've gone through and created a ISO that will allow you to install the full Ubuntu desktop on a Raspberry Pi four. Uh, with two gigabytes of RAM. Now, I do not have a Raspberry Pi 4 with two gigabytes of RAM, but I would imagine that this doesn't actually function all that well, but that you could yeah. do it. Yeah. Like I, I mean, mean, getting it to run is kind of different than it being usable. This is GNOME, okay? Like, GNOME mm-hmm. kind of is sluggish on a PC that has, like, a Ryzen 7 3800X, you know? And this is just like a little arm... I don't know. It'd be interesting Dude, four to Four gigabytes how... with GNOME on it? Like, you don't have much extra space to play around with for programs. Yeah. I don't know. It'd be interesting to see how it actually does run. Because, I mean, they've gone through and done it. Like... I think it was more like a like a thought experiment. experiment. Maybe... The thing about this is that's kind of exciting is that if they can go through and make... Ubuntu usable on this like amount of RAM, that would then I would think filter into like the actual Ubuntu experience and making that faster across the board. That'd be cool. Yeah. Hey, I mean, like to be honest, Ubuntu is kind of already pretty. I mean, it's still GNOME and GNOME's not extremely fast, but it is. It's gotten a lot better. Um, really, in all honesty, if Ubuntu can just figure out the like Wayland issues and ensure that like, you know, Wayland doesn't give me like a pink hue over all my screen. Like, you know, that'd be great. Um, uh, but I don't know that like a GNOME getting faster. I hope this will translate over, but from everything that I see with the GNOME team, like, uh, an advancement with GNOME in like one area of computing does not translate over typically to GNOME in just general. Well, sadly, Maybe a Ubuntu version of GNOME it would work fine, but that that that's this stuff's never going to go upstream. Because yeah, yeah. If if the way the GNOME developers do things is, uh, if we didn't create it, it doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. that's the, the way it is. So, but apparent according to the article on OMG Ubuntu, this is actually fairly quick on the two gigabyte two gigabyte RAM Pi. It says it is uh, speedy. Um, I mean, I'd love to try it, but I, I, yeah. I, I have my doubts. Yeah. But I, I don't of, have a Raspberry Pi 4 just laying around to try it, because I definitely would, because I just, I don't believe it's snappy. Yeah, okay. 
there's going to be that doubt. There's always going to be the doubt there. Now I'm going to have to go get a Raspberry Pi 4. But the mm -hmm. thing is, is if I were to buy a Raspberry Pi 4, I wouldn't want the 2 gigabyte of RAM one anyways. No. N hell no. Hell no. Like, it, it, just pay a few more dollars and get the 8 gigabyte one. Then you have some overhead room, you know? Yeah. Um, the, the thing about the Raspberry Pi 4, the, the Raspberry Pi thing is, it's... Like, it feels like it's, like, one or two generations from being something like... You, like, if you wanted to, in, like, a couple generations, you could use it as your desktop computer. Like, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it seems like it's so close. It's, like, it's so close, right? Um, I don't even think it's a couple generations away. Like, I'm just waiting for Raspberry Pi to announce their next product where I'm like, oh, okay, this is the one where it's finally usable. Like, like it's, it just it, seems like it's so it's just, close it's there. Getting, it's, like, it's really, really getting there. And once that happens, I mean, you imagine being able to buy a functional computer that you can use as a desktop system to do everything you'd normally do on a desktop system, like, you know, for like 40 bucks. <laughs> That's just insane. Incredible. Right? I mean, especially in this day and age where you can't even buy toilet paper for 40 <laughs> Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's just it's it's just kind of insane. Um. So yeah, I'm really really excited. The thing is is I have a confession. But I've never owned a Raspberry Pi f before. Um, really? Like I've wanted one, but I always think like you know what, Matt? What are you gonna use it for? Uh, like you really? have a you have an extra computer there. You have five laptops sitting around. What I mean. That's kind of the problem with Raspberry Pis is like you're really excited you get you get one like from I've I've owned two and you play with them for a while and if you don't have a good like if you don't need like a TV like you know that's not smart that you need to plug something up to and like run Cody or something like yeah. that to get TV on there like then it's really nice but practically like other than messing around with it, it doesn't get much use just See, sad. What I think I want to do is eventually, because you can create a NAS with a with a Raspberry Pi four, right? So you can go through and get you know like several hard drives and kind of raid them together in a NAS. And they have these hard drive enclosures that look like NASes, right? But they're just hard drive enclosures. If you plug them into your computer, they'd appear as five separate hard drives. Mm -hmm. um, and they're really cheap; they're like one hundred fifty bucks. Now, granted. Hard drives are fucking expensive, but yeah. uh, which is what's preventing me from doing this. But you could go through and buy one of those, get yourself your five hard drives, and then hook it up to a Raspberry Pi, which would then handle the software RAID and probably put use free NAS or something like that. And uh, you'd have a, a, a NAS for like half the price of like a, a QNAP or a, a, a one of the expensive Synology things. Um, and that really appeals to me because I need a new hard drive. The, the external hard drive that I save all my stuff to makes horrendous sounds and it scares the living daylight <laughs> out of me. You. Okay, thank you. I am so glad you said that. I have a 14 terabyte drive that I got for Christmas. That It's a it's a like USB one that plugs up. It's super nice. I love it. It makes noises that like sometimes I look at it and I'm genuinely like scared. Like, is it Western it, Digital? I, I believe so. If I yes, it's, yes, yes, it is. It's a my book. It's a Western Digital my book. Uh, the thing is, it's done it since. Like, the thing is, it's not old. It's like it's like a year. This thing's brand new. Right? It's brand new. And like, mechanical hard drives are going to make noise, right? You've always heard like the in, like in a computer with them, like old computers they make noise. But this thing sounds like it's starting an engine, like mm -hmm. and rumbling up a, like a wooden or like a, a gravel driveway. <laughs> It's horrendous. Yeah. Like the, sometimes this thing, like it knocks. It's like it, like it will like knock on like a. Again, like I know it's not breaking or anything, but it's just it's it so feels weird. like it's trying to crawl across your desk. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like I don't understand why this thing makes more noise than a, the. It, like I have two mechanical hard drives in my computer. I use them all the time. They don't make hardly any noise. But in this thing, it sounds like a fucking... It's, it's horrible. And it's like... It's, it, it sounds like it's failing. And it scares yeah. me. Because, like, That's, all of my stuff is on there. Yes, I have backups of it. But it's not... They're not, like, real-time backups. I have to do them with R-Sync. Because uh, of reasons. And it, it's really hard to find a cloud provider that can back up, like, three terabytes of stuff. Uh, yeah. For, like, a reasonable price. I'm not... I'm not paying hundreds of dollars a month to back up my stuff. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> I, I just buy a few Come hard on. drives. You know what I mean? 
Okay. Well, so so what I'm hearing now is that you just don't ha- like you're poor. That's that's why I'm here. You're poor. You can't spend a couple hundred dollars to save up all your data a month. A month. Come on. <laughs> this is Come basically on. this is like we're, we're approaching rent territory. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, who needs a subscription service? Anyways. Um, no. Truth. Anyway, so that is it for the news. Let's go ahead and move on to the main topic, which is tool, dual foe. Du, du, I can't talk. It's like all the words just went right out of my mouth hole in different order than what they should have done. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> this is what this is. This is the reason why it's been so hard. To, like last week, I was bragging. Like, I, oh yeah, I've, re- I've recorded ten videos in the last five days. This week, I've recorded hardly any videos because the words are coming out in weird orders. It's like I've had a stroke or something. It's really weird. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, the main topic, which is... Uh, I don't even know what I was going to say, which the words I messed up. Is we have I to believe sh- it was twofold. Twofold. Is what That's the word I was, yeah. lo- I was looking for. <laughs> wow, words. Like, you would almost think that I was a writer for a living or something. Because <laughs> I actually am. This is horrible. Anyway, so we're going to be talking about the best ways to switch to Linux, so things that you should do uh, when you switch to Linux, and we're gonna be, then we'll talk for a little while about the best new user distro. So Tyler, talk about some of the things that you think people should do when they switch to Linux. I'm highly interpret- interpreting your, your topic here, by the way. I mean, as, as you should. Um, I don't, to, to me, like when it comes to switching over to Linux, like kind of one of the main things that you need to do is not actually like a physical task that you need to take care of but kind of a, a, a mental one like when you're going into linux the whole point shouldn't i mean if you're interested in linux the whole point should not be to do the same things that you're doing in windows like if you're if your goal with your computer is to sit down and mess with absolutely nothing And then just get in and mess around with one program. If you're switching to Linux, like, again, you're not familiar with Linux, you're switching over to it. Don't spend a shitload of time, like, or be prepared to spend a shitload of time switching over because you're switching over. It's different. Um, I I feel like that's like a lot of people's problems when they switch over to Linux, like, they're in the same kind of mindset that I'm in right now. Like, I want to work on my game. That's that's it. If I have to do anything other, like, than working on my game, th- it's a problem. I, I don't want to have to do that. Um, if, if that's the mindset that you're in, you, it's probably not time for you to switch over to Linux yet. Like, when you, when you should switch over to Linux, it should be the day that you don't have anything to do that day. Um, you know, you're like your day is free and open and you're ready to take on any task that like your problem that you run into and fix it. Cause that's kind of the thing you're switching over. There's going to be things to change. Yeah. So the bottom line there is that Linux is not windows. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like Linux is not windows and you should, you should expect to come over and do something. You shouldn't expect to just install it and then be like, Oh, well, this is it. I'm done. Where's like, my Adobe? Where's my exactly. Adobe? You know, yeah, okay. All right. So for me, the number one, all right, so there's a couple of things that you sh- you just absolutely have to do. First of all, back up your data. Like back it up your data on a hard drive that is not the hard drive you're going to be installing Linux on. Uh all of your data. Like documents, photos, everything. Put it on next. You should be doing this anyways, by the way. This isn't just because no. of your you're switching to Linux. You should be backing up your data. The second thing you should do uh, is not worry about your distro or any of that stuff, but be prepared to have a dual boot. I think, I really do think, okay, let me put it this way. I think for some people, dual booting is still a good option. Um, so for some people, not. Uh, if you're more technologically minded, if you're someone who do, likes to tinker and doesn't have a problem with learning the terminal and all that stuff, wipe away your hard drive and just switch to Linux. 
Uh, if you're the kind of person who you're technological enough that you know how to burn an ISO and get into the boot menu and install Linux, but there's still things that you don't know how to do technological wise, I think that for you, the best thing that you could do is, is dual boot. And the reason why is because then when you come to a part where you don't know how to do something on Linux, but you're not quite there yet in terms of wanting to uh, learn how to do it, you can, but you have to do it like right now, you can go in and do it on Windows and you kind of use it as a safety blanket. I don't think that that's the case for everyone and it's probably not a good idea for most people, but I think... Uh, th that's one thing that you should do but and, but to go along with that and the reason why I thought about dual booting and, and this is something that came up in uh, my discord server for somebody who was switching to Linux uh, a few days ago there's an option in almost every graphical installer that says install alongside uh, mm -hmm. so if you have a, a Windows taking up your entire partition uh, a Linux installer will ask you if you want to install Linux alongside Windows and it'll try to uh, repartition your Windows drive so that it can install Win Linux on it. I beg and plead with you, do not use this option. It, yes. it will not work. Okay, I'm sure there's somebody out there that says, well Matt, I used it, it worked fine. You're the exception to the rule. For the most part, that option just does not work and the reason why is because windows is so attached to its own bootloader if you try to change that bootloader your windows install is just not going to work uh, mm -hmm. chances are your your linux thing will be fine but you'll never see your linux your windows <laughs> thing again um and it's just because windows likes to control the bootloader so don't do that if, if you are going to dual boot if you're going to keep windows on there Install Linux first, and then reinstall Windows, and let Windows control its, its bootloader. Or, or the other way around. It probably would work, as long as you leave an extra partition there. You probably could find... I mean, you'd have to know a lot more about Grub that way. But I, So I'd say Linux first, and then Windows. That's the way I'd say it. Um, yeah. the, I, that's one of the questions that I get a lot, right? Is that, why can't I install alongside? Like, Windows will actually go through and do that if you... If you in their installer it will install alongside you can do that or at least you used to be able to um but that doesn't work either so don't do that no in windows i don't think you can do alongside anymore if you've partitioned and left an open partition and tell windows to install there it'll do it um but yeah they like alongside thing it's kind of like if you're installing if you're installing a Linux distro on a drive with another Linux distro, yeah, you can install alongside and it'll work fine. Because like Linux distros kind of respect each other. Yeah. Again, you're more likely to have a problem doing it that way. But typically, Linux distros will shake hands. I mean, you're a more lot you're, you're more likely to have a Linux install work that way than you ever will a Windows one. Uh, yeah. I still wouldn't do it. Um, just because I mean, because basically what you're doing. I mean, obviously, Tyler, you know this, but basically what you're doing is your Windows or your whatever you have on that hard drive is taking Wait, up the whole hard drive. While you're, while you're explaining, I'm sorry to cut you off, but while you're explaining that, I'm going to run to the bathroom because I've drank like almost all of this water and I'm going to die. Okay. Um, Don't die in the, the bathroom. Worst. I mean, that'd be a horrible place to die. Um, <laughs> anyway, so what basically what that install alongside thing does is it, it has your whole Windows drive there. Your Windows takes up the entire drive. And then when it wants to install whatever you're installing, it tries to push things towards the beginning of the disk. I think it's the beginning of the disk. But anyways, and it tries to make space for your Linux partition. And then the problem emerges when it tries to uh, control the, gr the bootloader, in this case, usually Grub. And the thing is, is Windows doesn't often deal well with Grub when it's installed in that manner. So... Um, it's just a matter, and, and the problem is, is that if you are messing around with your partitions and moving data around and stuff like that, there's a good chance that while things are being moved around, you're going to lose data. And that's a, obviously a bad thing. So, um, this is like hearkening back to when I did the podcast all by myself. <laughs> I'm literally talking to myself again on the stream. So, um, another thing you should do if you're going to switch to Linux is 
be a Tyler was already talking about this that, that Linux is not Windows. So what you need to do is be adaptable to change. Like cuz like Tyler was talking about you're not going to be able to go into Linux and do the stuff the same way you you plan on doing it. But the bigger thing is that you're not going to be able to go into Linux and find the same programs that you're familiar with. So you have to be open to the idea of changing your workflow to suit the programs that are actually available on Linux. If you're not open to do that, then like Tyler said, don't switch to Linux. So, like for example, if you're used to using Adobe Audition to edit audio, it doesn't exist on Linux. You could probably try to get to work through Wine, but that's beyond a new thing to do. So, you're going to have to find something else. So, whether you're using something like Audacity or our doer or whatever the hell it's called you know uh, you're going those are going to work different than Aud than audition ever did so you're going to learn that thing so i got no nope. burps anyways uh did you, i see you did not die in the bathroom tyler thankfully no um but it is now duly noted don't drink an entire smart water um as the podcast is starting turns out not so yeah. smart <laughs> yeah no no not a good idea okay so you got anything else here for uh things you, sh you should do to switch to linux um really really kind of like I, I would elaborate on what you're talking about when it comes to like in installing it like prepping like obviously you know backing up your data should already be done but really if you want to have a really smooth time with trying out linux just having a whole drive just just be like have a whole drive that you're just going to install linux to whether it be a separate one or the one that you ha have mm -hmm. windows on already use the entire drive you're you're much less likely to have problems there again dual booting is an option but typically speaking you're going to have issues and if you if you enter in with the right type of mindset and Part of that mindset being that that day that you're going to be trying out Linux, you've got all day. You can just play around with your computer and Linux and not have a problem. You're probably more likely to have a good time because yeah. whatever you have, like issue wise, I mean, if if you don't care and you haven't spent seven hours trying to figure out the perfect Linux distro to install, which is again the dumbest thing ever, like. To me, I feel like that's a lot. A lot of what causes issues. People spend a lot of time trying to figure out the best Linux distro to install first, and then when they install it and have an issue, they're like, "Okay, this is this is not good. This is terrible." It's like, well, instead of spending three hours trying to figure out which Linux distro is the best, which you haven't even tried out one yet, try them out. Like, just yeah. spend the day trying them out. Yeah, that's the best advice that you could give. Is just don't choose a best Linux distro, which is silly because we're going to talk about the best Linux distro here in a minute. But <laughs> um, <laughs> try them all. Don't be afraid to try stuff. I mean, if if Audacity in that example I gave earlier, if Audacity doesn't work for your audio editing and in in you know recording needs, try something else. There's nine. There's like forty different audio editing tools and audio recording tools on Linux. Probably more. Uh, try them all. If, if one doesn't work, chances are another one will work. Um, and a, a lot of the times, too, people are like, well, I mean, I, w I, w I would like to, but to me, the only like the best looking Linux distro or the only one that I would want to use is GNOME, like or, you know, like Ubuntu or something like that. Like, here's the thing. If you find a Linux distro that looks really appealing to you, but it doesn't work right on your system and the Linux distro that does work right on your system, you don't really like the way that it looks. You're on Linux. You can change it. Yeah, don't like, don't get it. Don't get attached to the desktop environment. It's, that's probably the problem that I had when I first started Linux, was that I I liked the way something else looked, so I went and just used that, and that's why I hopped so much. It was, but it, that that's a good point. Is that understand the difference between distro and desktop environment? Desktop environments can be installed anywhere. It doesn't matter what distro you're using. Uh, and and then the distro thing would basically the only thing on, the only thing that matters when it comes to distro is package manager okay yeah and uh, that's probably the next thing I, we should talk about is that the, the the don't go when you while you're hopping around distros don't assume they all work the exact same way they're gonna oh, uh, yeah they're gonna they're gonna work 
mostly the same way. Like you can open up a file manager and your file manager is going to mostly do the same thing every other file manager is going to do because it's a file manager. They manage do files. The same thing. Yeah. Um, where you're going to find differences is, is, is in the, we saw this in the Linus Tech Tip things where he tried to install something on Manjaro after he hopped from Pop! OS with, with apt. Like mm-hmm. that's, I mean, we made fun of him for that, but that's a new user thing. You assume that installing software on Linux is the same across the board and it is not because they use different package managers. Mm-hmm. Um, so learn the when you hop through distros, and we highly recommend you hop through as many distros as you want to use um, to find the best one for you. Eventually, you, you might be like me and always come back to Ar- to the, to the, to Arco, you know, because mm-hmm. um, it's the best. Or you might be like Tyler, who's never found a a, a, a good tiling or a good uh, Linux distro and is using Windows. Um, <laughs> I- Okay, Arch is home, but yeah, sure. <laughs> <coughs> anyway, so try them all, but understand that the package managers are going to be different depending on which one you are. And this becomes harder to understand when you hop between uh, sibling distros. So, for example, if you hop, hop from uh, Ubuntu to Linux Mint, they use the same package manager. They, no, they they are essentially the same, right? Like, and the same thing we're hopping from like Mint to Debian or Debian to Elementary OS or whatever. They all use the same package manager, but then you choose to go to a different family of distros. So you move to Manjaro or Endeavor OS or Arc or whatever. Then it uses Pacman. It's it's different. So that distinction can be very hard for new users to grasp. And the best thing you can do, the absolute best thing you can do, is when you are moving around Linux and you're installing it for the first time, do not be afraid to ask for help. Like, join a Discord server like the LinuxCast des- Discord server or Zany's Loft. Go in there and ask for help. You're going to have some people who are saying, well, you shouldn't use this distro, you should use Gentoo. Ignore those people, okay? Yeah. They're, they're, they're just and trolling also, you for I last. will say, you won't find those kinds of people in our Discords pretty much at you, all you will like, find them in our discord to, to be honest tyler you, i mean like look they're, they're, you'll, you'll they're. definitely you'll <laughs> definitely get somebody who will send you a troll message who will be like yeah you should just install gen 2 but as the, at the same time you get that message there'll be someone else who's typing out and giving you a real answer yes, yes. Right. That, that, that's a matter of fact the exact scenario happened the other day somebody asked what district should i use one of the gen 2 guys because well, you should use gen 2 and um uh, and I, and another part of point, what you should do is do sudo rm dash rf. You know, you know <laughs> like don't do that either. Okay, uh, so you are going to meet trolls in the Linux community, but for the most part, you're gonna fi- have a good experience with finding someone who's going to answer your question without being a douchebag about it. Mm-hmm. And that's the number one thing you can do is ask for help. If you don't understand something. The worst that's going to happen outside of the trolls is someone's going to tell you, you know, they're going to send you a link and say, hey, go read this. You know, they're going to send you a tutorial to the Arch, you know, or a link to the Arch wiki or to the Ubuntu wiki or the the whatever. That's that's likely to happen more often. They're not telling you that they're too lazy to help you. They're just saying, hey, this question gets asked a lot. Go read this. So. That's the best and, thing. And uh, a lot of the times when it comes to like Linux and stuff, when when newcomers come over and they get like overwhelmed, is like you also have to understand like the reason why it's important for you to try a lot of them is because every single Linux distro is made for a different person, a different use case. Someone who is using Debian only cares about stability. They don't care about the amount of software that is available to them. They don't care. As long as the system stays running and the few programs that they need that is used pretty much everywhere on Linux are available, they're fine. If you're someone who likes to use Discord, Spotify, um, you use every weird program under the sun, you're like me, you use Unity Hub as well as the other weird programs, you probably want to go with something like Arch or another Linux distro that's Arch based or focuses on software availability availability like Arch does. It's you'll just have to find your way around Linux. Yeah. All right. So a couple things we should, we should talk we should talk about distros for a few minutes. But uh, I just wanted to to make the comment that I'm not 
disparaging upon the character of people who like to use Gen two. <laughs> I don't want to hear. I don't. I don't want to hear from from you guys that says I I hate you guys and I'm always saying bad things about Gen two. Gen two is probably a fine distribution. I'm sure it is, but. Even Gen 2 users have got to admit that if you've never used Linux before, Gen 2 is not the freaking option. Well, yeah, that and also anytime someone's asking what Linux distribution they should use, 99.9% .9 of the time recommending Gen 2 is a terrible terrible because option. someone's going to take you seriously, okay? Yes. And, and <laughs> I mean like Gen 2 is good if you want to do everything like if you want to become a packet or a, a system maintainer like yeah gen 2 is the distribution for you but in almost every case when someone's asking like hey i i like to use x program or um my system's not fast enough what should i use gen 2 is not the option like it's just well, not i mean i'm sure it it, it can't gen 2 is the solution for when you're bored and you want to hop to a distro you've never used before or you've used gen 2 before you know what i mean it, it it's uh, it's fine for an experiment or for someone who has the time and interest in learning how to do it it's it's an explicit choice distro you have to choose to do it yeah. it's not something you install it's not something like hey i want a distro hop uh, I'm new to Linux. I'm gonna go <laughs> use Gen two. That's just that that scenario has rarely, if ever, ha happened. Uh, so the, the I just wanted to point that I I I saw some people in the in the comments saying, "Well, Gen two is great." Like, I'm sure Gen two is great, but it's the same thing. I would never point a brand new user to to vanilla Arch Linux, even with all the installers now for vanilla Arch Linux. I don't think it's a good option for new users. I'm not no. even sure like Manjaro is a good option for new users, but it's at least more of an option than Vanilla Arch is, you know. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that, that's the thing. So, I guess that kind of leads us to, to talk a little bit about if you were to switch to Linux and you're brand new, what distro should you choose? Now, we've already said try them all, but if you were to choose one, a starting point for your journey of hopping. Tyler, what brand new, uh, what what distro should a brand new user choose? Um, for me, I it it depends. Like, I I really want to say elementary OS. I really want to because it's so damn close to being exactly what you should give a new user. Because it's there's I mean you don't have a wealth of stuff to change. Uh, about like aesthetics and everything like yeah you can change a few options but kind of what you're going to get in windows or mac nothing insane um and it's very it's it's a limiting sort of desktop environment um but for good reason like it makes sense i just i don't know that i would recommend it to a new user yet because you still have to understand flat hub and how to uh, no Fuck all that shit. To be honest, if you're a new user, just try Linux Mint. Like, look, I'm not a big fan of Linux Mint, but Linux Mint, it it's pretty it's pretty rock solid. You're killing me here. Don't use Linux Mint. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right. So, uh, Elementary OS is a good choice, but here's my my answer to the question: Use Ubuntu. Okay, and. It's not because Ubuntu is okay. the best. It's because it's not not because it's the best distro or it's the best looking distro or any of this stuff. But Ubuntu is the most popular distro you can that's out there. Like the vast majority of people who use Linux use Ubuntu or okay. a flavor of Ubuntu. But the vast majority of people use Ubuntu. And the thing is, is when you're a new user and you need help, the first thing you're gonna do is go to Google and search for how do I do this thing or I've gotten this error, how do I fix it? And the vast majority of those tutorials are written for Ubuntu. Yes. Um, so if you're on Arch and have that problem and you Google how do I do this on Linux, you're going to get tutorials for Ubuntu and the process is not going to be the same. You're going to have a bad experience. So start with Ubuntu, learn how to use Linux, okay? Use how to use the terminal, learn how to use app, learn how to get into the software manager, how to do updates, all this stuff. Find the programs you want to use and experience your walking, your, your, your growing pains on Ubuntu because that way when you experience those pains and you have problems, 
you can find tutorials because I, I swear to God, if you're having that problem on Ubuntu, 9,000 other people have had the exact same problem and one of those people have a blog and they've, you know, have they have a medium blog or something and they've put that solution on the internet somewhere. No. That's why you should See, here's Ubuntu. my thing though. Like when it comes to Ubuntu, like to me, I think Ubuntu is not even a good recommendation anymore because it snaps. No, not even that, because Ubuntu doesn't work on my system. Oh. Like, well, Linux uh, Mint okay. does. All right. I, like, I, I just wanna, I want to I wanna hold you right there, Tyler. The vast majority of people who are running computers don't have a vertical monitor. No, but they do have a monitor or possibly a up-to-date graphics card. Like, if you have... Let's just say that you have newer hardware. Like... Okay. Well, see, here, here's my main argument against it. What is Linux Mint? Like, at, at, what is literally Linux Mint? It's Ubuntu. That's, that's all it is. Well, I mean, that, that, that's true. But your argument is that if you have new hardware, Ubuntu is going to be bad. In your experience, well, not, not bad, but has, it's going to have issues. The problem with that argument is that you've had issues in every distro. Yes. That, that's a Linux problem. That's not... Well, yes, but Ubuntu now because of because of it using Wayland by default. Like, I understand that. Yes, as as a Linux user, I know that I can go down and switch over to Xorg and not have problems. But regardless, given to a new user, someone who's just trying to get into it and mess around and and play with it, um, Ubuntu on my system on my regular screen, not my vertical monitor. My vertical monitor can piss off here. That's going to have issues everywhere. My main monitor and that one c comes with a pink hue. Like they have a pink hue. There's no way I can fix it. I have no idea how to do it. I have to switch to Xorg to get it gone. At least with Linux Mint on any piece of hardware that you have, it just functions. I mean, are it just you, loads up. I mean, I'd ask you, have you tried Linux Mint on your new setup yet? Because you might have had... Yes. Might, you have? Okay, so yeah. you might be... Ha okay. Maybe you're right then. Use a, use Linux Mint. But I would still say... I, if you're going to go the Linux Mint route, then you should at least understand the, that they're the same. So you can follow yeah. the same tutorials. Okay? Yeah. At least then understand that. I would still like, say... Look, I, I'm not going to force you to say that you should use Linux Mint because I know no, I, I know that would hurt. You, you, couldn't force, <laughs> you couldn't force me to do that. Um, I mean, you can use Linux Mint if that's what you want to do. <laughs> but there are better options. <laughs> <laughs> there are better options. Uh, no, no, Linux Mint is fine. I just have the pro I have problems with their development team. That's There's my... I have problems with Linux Mint because of that. Not because Cinnamon is a fine desktop environment. It's actually probably if you are coming from Windows, uh, the best things you could do if you're if you're looking for the best Windows like experience, either Cinnamon or Zorn OS are going to be your options. They're both based on Ubuntu, or the Cinnamon vision of Linux Mint. I mean, they're both based on Ubuntu. They both look and function almost identically to Windows in almost every superficial way you can talk about. Once you get, you drill into other things, obviously package management stuff like that, they're going to be obviously different. But at least in terms of look and feel, they're, uh, similar. they're similar. So if that's what matters to you, the look of your, your thing, and you want to look as similar to Windows as possible, uh, one of those is option. For, so for example, I switched my dad to Ubuntu. And he's been using Windows for the entire time to use a computer. He's had no problems. In fact, he loves the idea that he never has to do an update. I mean, granted, I do the update, so he it, he doesn't actually, <laughs> you know, realize that those things happen. But if he with Windows, every time he shut the computer down at night, he'd have to wait for it to say, "Oh, doing updates, ten percent, eleven percent." You know, it, it doesn't do that. So he loves that. I get, updates drive him crazy, like absolutely, like not just crazy, but furiously mad like why the hell is this thing doing updates i don't want to change it's perfectly fine the way it is you know so mm -hmm. he loves linux for that like the thing is if i could get my mom to switch to linux like the whole like family would be using linux right now but she's like the one holdout for windows and it's because file managers on linux and file pickers on on linux are terrible <laughs> like they're so bad all right so um 
That is, uh, those are the answers. I'm, if you're watching the replay of this uh, podcast, the live version, uh, you can go through the, the chat, and a lot of the people in chat had their own opinions. We were kind of ignoring you guys. Uh, no offense. Uh, but um, Sorry. <laughs> Uh, if we if we stopped and, and talked to the chat, the, the the podcast would be six hours long. Um, mm-hmm. That's just the way it is. So that is uh, just the you know. If if you're watching, I'm sure there's like four people out there that's upset. Yeah, you know, like six hour podcast. Like door. <laughs> Maybe someday we'll do like a six hour podcast. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. An hour and a half already. I want to get out of this chair. <laughs> Hair, mm-hmm. you know uh but maybe for like um fifty thousand subscribers we'll do a long podcast that's so there far away it's so so far <laughs> away we don't have to worry about it <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and by the time we hit fifty thousand subscribers we just be like I, I, what are you talking about i don't remember uh, this it's not yeah. ob- obviously we didn't record this thing <laughs> yeah yeah this podcast suddenly slips you know it just gets unlisted accidentally <laughs> somehow <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately it's not in the free show the the post show that's what would only be available to certain members so <laughs> <gasps> <laughs> All right. Anyway, so that is uh, it for the main topic. Now, uh, we have a section at the end of the show where we call picks of the week. And usually we have two of those things. But this week, the Windows user of the bunch of us didn't have one. So yeah, yeah. whatever. All right. So my pick of the week, and this is available in uh, Chrome-based browsers. It's available in Edge. It's available in uh, Chromium and Brave and Chrome itself. And they're called tab groups. Now, I don't know how I didn't know that these things existed because they've been around for a little while, but oh my God, they're so good. All right, so basically what this is, is it allows you to go through. So let's just say you're the kind of person who has 50 or 60 or 70 tabs open at a time. I'm not going to judge you. I have workspaces like that. It's good. I don't have that many tabs, but I usually have 30 to 40. And especially when I have open up like a, a website where I like for a video idea or something like that, and I just want to save it, it's easier just to keep the tab open. The thing with tab groups is you can go through and create groups of tabs that will co- be color coded, and then you can collapse them so that you so that they're not spread out all the way along the you know the 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 whole bar. They're just collapsed into the category of tab that you have. So look for, for right now, I have ideas, I have things to read, and I have like a, a stories one. And they each have like 10 tabs in them, and then you can collapse them. So it only looks like I have three or four tabs open, but really I have 40 tabs open. <laughs> it is so cool. Um, like how did I not know this? And the only downside, at least in terms of the Chromium-based implementation of this, is that by default you can't save them. So unless it's okay as long as you have your browser set up so that it starts back up where you left off, it'll reopen the the, the groups just fine then. But only if you have one window. If you have multiple windows and then you have groups in different windows. And you close down, then you're going to lose stuff. You'll have to open up the uh, open them up again. Uh, they do have a, like a Chrome flag or whatever where you can enable saving. So maybe that'll eventually come to like the stable version. Uh, but other than that, oh, so good, man. I, I just like, like, yeah, I know you shouldn't use that many tabs and have that many tabs open all the time, but I do. The fact that I can now organize them by category and collapse them is just, I mean, it's literally life changing. It's so good. Yeah. So good. Well, um, I do have a question when it comes to your tab groups. It, do you think this is only going to encourage you to have more tabs open at oh, once? Oh, most definitely. Like, there, there's going to be points now where there's going to be some stuff. Well, okay, so for example, I have. Uh, in some of my ideas, in, in my ideas category, I have some tabs in there that have been open for months. Like, they've been open for months. Every time I reopen up the, the browser, they just open up, right? So, for example, I have one here uh, of a tutorial of how to SSH into a virtual box, uh, VM. Uh, and I want to do, uh, do a video on that eventually, uh, but I haven't got around to it yet. So, I have the tab open there. I mean, I could just save the link somewhere. I'm I mean, I'm sure that could be possible, but this is just easier. I also have one for Win- uh, River Window Manager. It's been there for months, um, and eventually I'm going to get to those things, but now I don't have to see those things. They're just kind of shoved into a category somewhere, and it's just I can just collapse them. 
Uh, so yes, definitely. I will definitely be opening up more and more tabs. I just wanted to make sure that, like, I just I just knew that this was definitely encouraging bad behavior. So the, 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 the thing is, is that now that I have this, you don't really know how many tabs you have open total. Like before, if you had like all your tabs open, and it, you know they got really small, right? You know, like really mm-hmm. really small, and it just it took up the whole bar. And you realize like, holy crap, I have a lot of tabs open. But now, I'm looking right now. I, I have three pin tabs, three groups. And three open like regular tabs, and that's it. So it looks like I only have like nine tabs open, but really there's forty there. So if I opened up like a system monitor right now, why is why is Brave taking up twelve gigabytes of RAM? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so um, MH says that Firefox has collapsible tab tab categories as well. I did not know that. Um, granted, Ooh. it's been now a couple months since I've actually used Firefox, which is like a a world record for me uh, to, no. to me i think it's really sad that every time i go like because uh even though i'm on windows it's not like i haven't been trying out different linux distros and seeing uh what's different um i don't even use firefox and linux anymore like why like the thing i missed most about firefox when i switched away from it is the user chrome the ability to change the ui i missed that for about a week now I'm used to just used to the way Brave looks. I Ooh. still don't love Brave. I still have the stupid cryptocurrency ads enabled. I don't know why I do, but I'm, I'm it's like I'm performing a social experiment where I'm trying to figure out how many how much money I can make use that with that cr- stupid cryptocurrency. Um, and I'm pretty Ooh. sure that I've had those Brave ads now enabled for like over a month now. I've earned like a dollar fifty, you know. <laughs> <laughs> worth it right oh definitely i'm gonna spend that all in one place like i don't like we can't even buy a fucking roll of toilet paper for that. there you <laughs> go there you go that's the there you go you just save up you get yourself a free roll of toilet paper it'll all be worth it <laughs> it's like uh, cryptocurrency is completely worth it's just it's, it's fake it's monopoly money is what it is um anyways that is it for us on this podcast. Holy crap. We've been going for freaking ever. We're over an hour, which, I mean, we're really actually pretty consistent. Between an hour and an hour and ten minutes is usually where we're at. That's pretty much the consistent for record time, so we're pretty good. Uh, if you uh, want to get in contact with us, all the contact information was provided earlier in the show, so I'm not going to go through and give that again. Patreon.com slash LinuxCast. Before I go, or before we go, we should talk about our current patrons today. Devon, East Coast Web, Gen 2 is fun to... Oh, wait a minute. Gen 2 is fun to... Is not actually there anymore. I'm so used to saying it. Uh, Sid A, Devon, mm-hmm. East Coast Web, Petrico, Primus, Marcus, Maglin, Jackknife, Fool, Steve A, CyberGuy, Linux, Garrick, Mitchell, Arch Center, Carbon Dage, Sean, Jeremy, Odin, Merrick, Camp, Josh, Lee, J Dog, Peter, Crucible, and Dark Bandit 6. Holy crap, I almost made it all the way through in, in one breath there. Um, I got, I'm getting really good at it, but uh, people keep moving around. And it's, it's messing with my brain. So, uh, thanks everybody who supports us on Patreon. We really do appreciate it. Uh, I, I can't even begin to tell you how much. It, it, it just boggles my mind that people send me money uh, for mm-hmm. this nonsense. I mean, seriously, thank you so much. Uh, Tyler also has a Patreon page, but we don't know what the mm-hmm. link is. Is it uh, official it, Zany? It should be. It should be AKA Zany. AKA Zany. The problem is you yeah. have different URLs for everything. I, I only have two. It's, it's Zany OG and AKA Zany. But you That's have it. official Zany somewhere, right? It, Maybe. Uh, I used to use that. I don't think I use it anymore. Okay, so, I don't think I have any links. So, so. so patreon.com slash, slash aka zany will get you to Tyler's Patreon page. Um, so definitely support one of the two of us. It doesn't really seriously matter which one. Just if, yeah. if you, And we also do have the merch store, which is kind of the best way to support the podcast. Yes, th- there is a merch store. There, the link of that is in the video description and in every single video that we make. Um, so definitely check that stuff out. So uh, thanks everybody for watching. We record this live every Thursday around 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and I say around because it's usually at least quarter after before we even get started. And then we bullshit for 45 minutes and then we start recording and then it's 5 o'clock before we even get done. And uh, there's a reason why we had to take a potty break midway through. I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're, we're not there yet. Anyways, we're, we are done. Uh, thank you for watching. Coming up next week, I actually don't know what we're doing next week. So uh, it'll be a surprise for you and for me. So we'll see you then. See ya.